talk again about the Cohen world, Cohenville, and uh, the Cohen no. <coughs> Surprisingly enough. And uh, so just refresh your memory about the Cohen. Somebody asks the old, this old teacher, does a dog have Buddha nature or not? Buddha nature is something never, a, an imprecisely defined term, so let's just leave it that way. Um, does a dog have Buddha nature or not? And yes. Teach, yes. The teacher said yes. Actually. And, um, well, if she has Buddha nature, why did she jump into that bag of fur? And the teacher said, she knew what she was doing, and that's why she dogged her. <laughs> Became a dog. It was a great like, use of, you can see, just the way we would improvise a word. Um, <coughs> that teacher improvised the word, to dog, to become a dog. <laughs> and someone else heard about this and said, so, asked the same question later. Dog have Buddha nature or not? And the teacher this time said, no. Well, everything from the smallest thing, you know, from the smallest, like, ant to the greatest shining being has Buddha nature. Why doesn't the dog? And the teacher said, because she is beginning to awaken into a world of delusion. Fortunately, we don't have to unpack that bit. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the same people thought, that sounds like philosophy class. <laughs> and so they went straight for a different aspect of things. That, oh, something nonlinear is happening here. The person says, no, one time yes, another time. Can't be about the answer. Right. And you know that yourself. You know how you have this terrible dilemma and you think, I've got to do this or this. You know that whichever one you do, it's going to be wrong. Yeah. It's sort of like that. Yeah. <laughs> and so, so that the, the idea of coming up into the dilemma, into the predicament, was very, a, a very strong one in Zen. So we might see in Zen, in the beginning was the predicament. <laughs> and, and, that, and that Zen doesn't try to think its way through. I mean, some predicaments you can think your way through, you can work out well. What's the return on this investment, you know, versus the risk, and do some sort of number thing. You know. But the great things in life aren't like that. You know, how do we love? How do we live in a way that brings us joy and an open heart and stuff like that? So the implication in Zen was to trust your predicament. That'd be one thing. So if you feel like you're stuck in some way, you know how the mind is always making this furious attempts to find its way out, you know, um, way you, you're stuck, you know. What will I do about my whatever it is, my job, the meaning of life, my relationship, my whatever it is, my self-criticism, my selfishness, my <laughs> whatever you're trying to do something about. Um, that's your predicament. And in some way the predicament, everybody's predicament, is kind of the same. We appear here in this form, and as soon as we appear in the body, it's going away. And so that's a profound, like, that will do for a predicament, you know? <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> no matter how much I work out, and, you know, I do yoga to get better, and then I hurt my back doing yoga. <laughs> and, um, and so on, you know. And, uh, and so, so there's a predicament just about being alive. And I don't, you know, I think you can overrate the fear of death, but death is part of it because the idea about being alive is you're intrinsically, it's an intrinsically fragile situation. You know, all sorts of things can happen. Pigs can fall on you. Um, <laughs> you know, not to mention more common things like car wrecks and cancer and things, yeah. Mm -hmm. Given that then, we're always trying to feel our way, find our way, wrestle our way out through, through the predicament that life has offered to us. And everybody has their own one, the terrible divorce case, or the, you know, 
the difficult, the loss of the loved one who died, you know, um, or just the impossible, you know, I'm a teenager and my parents just get me wrong all the time, you know, or I'm a parent and my teenager gets me wrong all the time. <laughs> so uh, all, all of that stuff, you know. So, so in Zen, the, you can tell that from the kind of answer that the teacher gave with, about the dog, the teacher wasn't really trying to take away your predicament. So we might say the other thing that was happening is the teacher was, you know, in a certain sense, taking a dive into the predicament with you, yeah. which is interesting. And, and, and there's something there you can tell, because you know, like when you, there's something really disturbing in your mind, and in a certain sense you turn towards it, then it might be painful, but it's not as disturbing. You know, that, that when we're trying to keep everything off with garlic and crosses and, and so on, then um, it's harder, you know, and we're trying to keep off what, what our problem is and argue against it. We're arguing against reality in some way. There might be a problem at work, it might be that someone who's not treating you fairly. It might be, you know, whatever it is. You just don't feel fulfilled. Whatever the predicament is. And so Zen says, you know, in a way it's better to hold yourself in it and trust it as your own life. It's your own. It's, a, it's, it's yours. It's for you. It's not, it's not something that randomly fell on your head like a pig. Um, <laughs> yeah. Graham Greene has a story about a guy who was killed by a pig falling off a balcony. Somehow it got in my mind tonight. <laughs> Thank you, Graham. Um, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> Did the pig make it? What's that? Did the pig make it? That's I don't know, his ankle did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The uncle didn't make it, but maybe the pig made it. I don't know. Maybe the pig, that was good for the pig. <laughs> yeah, pigs can be big. Big the pig. Um, so, so, um, so the, t the, the thing about the Cohen tradition is that, you, you know, if you're plunged into the predicament, you're trying to answer, you're trying to respond to your life in a different way from the way you usually respond to your life. So that, I think that's fairly clear just from the weird way this guy answers questions. Does a dog have Buddha nature or not? I mean, it's a sort of innocent question and you can see there's a certain, it goes to the idea of what about me when I feel really unworthy or, you know, <coughs> my portfolio just tanked or whatever your disaster <laughs> is, you know. I just made the wrong bet on I don't know, love work or a pig. You know. <laughs> um, but I just made the wrong bet, and so you know, that sense of shame that comes up and, uh, for people, for us, when when things go, don't go don't go the way we expected. Oh, at the, the, that moment, um, you know, does a dog? Do I still have something? Is there some light in me? Okay, so we can see that. But the teacher is also <coughs> somehow like pushing us into that instead of saying, never mind, dear, you're okay. Um, he's sort of saying, well, in a certain sense, that has to, that's the only response to something like that. It doesn't come from people reassuring us. It comes from us knowing for ourselves what life tastes like. So that's, that's going on. So, so the thing about sitting in a meditation hall and insanely getting possessed by a con or whatever's insanely possessing you today, um, is somehow in the service of that, it's in the service of, of some, some kind of deep, deeper approach to life, where we don't just console ourselves or distract ourselves, we're willing to confront the, rea the reality of life, and we're also willing to, to welcome that. You know? So there's a method implied here, which is that, you know, you know when you felt shame, you can't really reason your way out of it, you know. Um, if you feel ashamed or like you had a, a reversal and you feel bad about it and you're criticizing yourself or, 
you'll find one way you might notice you're criticizing yourself is that you're justifying yourself. You know? And you're explaining to this person why they got you wrong and how they got you wrong and things like that. Right? Most people, only 100% of the people ever have this experience, so I imagine you, know, <laughs> you recognize it. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, so um, and it's, a, it's an interesting thing. And one of the things a meditation retreat allows us to do is notice that stuff rather than just being flung about by it. You know, so the koan allows you to do that. But the koan does this other weird thing where, where it sort of starts to gather all the stuff that we might be concerned about into, this, into the koan. You know, so whatever's up for you will start appearing in your meditation. And that, that idea that the koan, first it sort of draws, it might draw your self-doubt or your thing. This sucks, and I've chosen the wrong people to be with yet again. <laughs> um, <laughs> and my knees hurt, and, and I'll be too embarrassed to leave. Um, or maybe I can sneak out of the break. And um, anyway, that kind of thing, or, or you know, oh my God, I'm not good at anything. Even this dopey thing I can't do. Meditating, everybody can meditate. Uh, not me. <laughs> and so the doubt, you know, whatever the doubt is, or, or you know, meditation is probably good, but this tradition isn't good. I just picked the wrong horse, you know. Um, so, so all that stuff comes up, and and, uh, and it's all a version of of I don't really belong here. I'm, I don't have a place in life. I'm not enough. You know, so there's that thing. I'm not sufficient for the life I have to live. So, uh, and so the, so the Zen solution was kind of interesting. Like one of them, there are different methods to work with the Khan and, and so I'll run through a little bit of method now. I, I'm susp- as you've probably noticed, I'm suspicious of method because there's always somebody doing the method to improve herself or himself. And, so there's already two thing, people going on there. There's the one being improved and the one improving. And you know, it just gets hard to keep track of all those people. You know? so, um, so, and, and it doesn't seem that it's like using the self to get rid of the self and you know, all this stuff. So, um, but method, anyway. No, nonetheless, we like method. We love method. We think this is a solution. You know? This must be the way out of the problem. I'll make a list. <laughs> if it comes out this way, I'll get a divorce. If it doesn't, I win. It doesn't matter how it comes out, you either get a divorce or you don't, and it's not that. You know? so, um, and that says nothing about dividing up the cat. Or, you know. so, so you have to, in a certain sense, this is a different way of doing it. You know? and, and, it's so, and, and the, the old Chinese thought was, they started to use, use the koan, and they, they particularly like one word koans. No was one, there were other one word koans. Barrier was another one. But the idea of a koan that you could push against in some way is no in a way is, yes is more expected than no, or hoped for. You know, all self-help manuals are full of the yes. <laughs> and so Zen said, we're not in that category actually. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> Try Cosmo for the sex of self-help sex. Um, and uh, and so um, it's um, so the the no is something, you know. It brings out the secret way we feel we're disqualified, or the secret way we might feel we're unworthy. Um, and then we realize, well, it can't just be supporting that. And there's some. And so there's a sort of relief there because I can face the ways I think I doubt or I might feel I failed. And that those things can start to come to the surface. So, so the first early days of Sashin can be a bit rough because you're dealing with all that stuff, you know, the demons and ghosts and so on. And, you know, the pain, there might be pains in the body, it might be whatever. But you're dealing with that no aspect of things, you know. And I don't know any way to get around it. We used to, you know, the Japanese system was to yell at people. It might work, you know. You should try harder. <laughs> Silence. Don't move. You know? And uh, that's the sort of meditation hall I grew up in. It was good enough for me. <laughs> it's like, 
you know, my parents used to say it was good enough to me to walk over cold gravel to school, you know, <laughs> bare feet in the snow. I like to do a Monty Python sketch. And so, um, the, uh, <laughs> But, but there was a, and it really doesn't matter how you do it, but, but the, the old tradition said, well, take that one word, and let's say it's no, we're working with no. There's a barrier was one, there are lots of others. There was just incoherent yelling was one. Ah! <laughs> I can't make that mean anything. So, so the no, you take it and just bring everything to it. And, the oil, and then you realize after you know, sort of all your energy, pour all your energy into it. And this is the old ancient medieval instructions. You pour all your life energy into that one word. So you don't really care. And after what is it? Is it no? Is it yes? Is it, you know, how do you spell of no? Anyway, is it on? You know, well, let's do it backwards. So um, and then and then you realize you're not very good at that. And it keeps sort of ba keep bouncing off it, and then it feels like this alien force or whatever happens. But then after a while, you realise that that your mind is changing a bit, but you've still got this wrestle going on, you know. But your mind is changing a bit because you're trying to concentrate on this one word, and you forgot about your problem, what your predicament, whatever it was. At least for five minutes, you forgot about your predicament. You know? And you forgot that you can't do koans anyway, and you hate them and all that stuff. And you're just like, you're just with this one word, no, no. And then you realize the nice thing about that is you realize that you can walk around with it. You can lie down with it. You can eat with it. You don't, like, the formality, the formal categories of meditation start to break down because it's like, so the formal categories of the sacred and the profane break down, break down. Because there's nothing that really needs to be not sacred. Yeah. Yeah. So it's not only in the meditation hall where you, you're doing a spiritual activity, you might be doing a spiritual activity when you're um, eating. Or someone in Nakagawa always likes to say, when you're going to the bathroom, that's mm -hmm. when it is. You know, that's the spiritual moment. Yeah. So, um, so, so we have, have this way of pouring ourselves into it. And then after that, you kind of like, there are a lot of different thing, ways to do it, you know, and I don't know. I mean, I just kept really trying really hard until at some stage I realized that trying to get somewhere means I'm not there, you know. And, and so, and people discover that, and there's so much effort and so much longing and so much me, really, and so much self-centeredness in a way going on, you know, <laughs> that, that, I don't know, it doesn't seem like this can be right, you know. <laughs> and so there's a, a sort of relaxation starts to happen, start to happen for me, and might happen for you. But so if you do the really pouring your energy into it path, eventually some, the flip starts to happen, you realize, oh, I'm not really working with the koan, the koan is some stuff to carry me. Now you realize that without, you don't have to torment yourself to realize that, you can just think, oh yeah, fair enough, I'll do it that way. You know, so start now. You know, so that's all right. But some of us felt like, because of whatever reasons, our upbringing or whatever, felt like we had to torment ourselves because otherwise we wouldn't be worthy. You know, and so um, so there is a strong strain in all most cultures, Western culture particularly, but most Asian cultures are the same. And I don't know about all cultures, but of you know the struggle and purification and so on and. So, I don't know, if you need to do it that way, I'm not complaining, but I don't think it's necessary. But I do think that in a certain sense, when you turn towards the koan, you turn away from the kind of solutions you've been doing. Well, I don't know, I feel really unhappy, and I don't like my inner life very much, so, you know, those new Mas Maseratis look pretty good to me. You know? <laughs> I could get one of the, or Tesla, I know, but yeah, everybody's got a Tesla now. <laughs> um, so, so um, like that. So, or, you know, whatever it is, you know, um, whatever it is for you, you know, uh, Hermes bag or something, you know, or, so it could be a consumer item, or it could be, it can be anything. Um, and then you realize that there's a kind of happy reaching for something and getting it 
is not the same as, as joy. And it's not the same as, as freedom. You know. And you can do it, and there's not probably, if you really want to get something or do something, you've got a reasonable chance of getting it and doing it, probably. But that's really different from whether your life is full and you have joy and love in your life. Right? So, fairly well established the truth that after a certain income level, happiness does not rise. You know? So, so um, and that's not a Puritan truth, it's just a pr truth about the psyche. It's just like what, what gives us joy. You know? So anyway, so, so, so we know that this, this is a strategy. What we're doing in the meditation hall is a different path, a different way of showing up in the world. And if you really pour your energy into the koan, um, after a while you'll find you can do it more delicately. You're probably pushing too hard and you can stop pushing so hard and you'll find it's just there. And we might say that you start to have confidence in yourself. And all the gothic f jokes about trying too hard and so on, I don't know, maybe some people, I, I did that, you know, and I don't know, I was that sort of personality, you know, just fanatical, I suppose, but I was just de desperate, you know, so I was willing to, you know, sit late at night and things like that. Um, and it was interesting, too, you know, it was really, you know, your mind gets really interesting when you're doing a lot of meditation, and life gets really interesting, and so, but even that's different from freedom. So anyway, so, so sooner or later, as you pour your energy into the column, you'll find that you can relax and you don't have, it's not this fighting and trying harder thing and, you know, um, that, that system, the Japanese medieval system of yelling at you, felt encouraging to them and it felt like, you know, like the football coach saying, you know, yelling at you on the side or something like that, to them, I think. But, but you know, it doesn't to us now. So, so, um, so, don't, so you don't need to do that to yourself. And, after a while, the greatest obstacle is your own self-criticism and self-doubt. You know? so, so easing, easing our, up on that allows you to start realizing, oh, the problem is not reality. The problem is that <coughs> I have all these thoughts and assessments and judgments and critiques in a way of reality. You know? And even if reality is quite difficult, it's reality. And in some way, I'll be OK there in a way I won't be with my thoughts. <laughs> well, I won't be in the world my thoughts are trying to make because it doesn't exist and so I'm always in this desperate situation of trying to catch up and force the world to be the way it should be when the world's never been the way it should be, never will be the way it should be. And in fact, I don't know what the word should means in that context. The world is just going to be the world. And I'm also, not only are you going to be who you are, and you're going to love me, or leave me, or praise me, or blame me according to your lights and according to you and your loud. Um, but uh, that's all right. And, if I, and when we're at peace and at home, we're allowed to feel what we feel. You know, I, I, we don't. We don't need. We're not the slaves to each other's approval, but we're also not slaves to our own approval of ourselves. You know, we're not criticizing ourselves and saying, oh, that was great, I did that well, and this is horrible, you know. And, and it's not like that. Life isn't really like that. Life is much more vivid and genuine than that. There's just life. You know? There's just walking, there's just laughing, there's just weeping. So the koan brings us into that realm. And then various things will happen, but it's once you're in that realm, um, you know, you get little tastes of it, everybody has a little taste of it, it's like stepping through a gateway, you know, that, that there's some sort of joy that things are beautiful, nobody looks ugly, you're not, there's nothing really wrong with you, you know, um, and in fact we can speak about the perfection of creation, you know, because we can experience it and we can feel it, you know. And then immediately we think, wow, that's great. And then we've got this, oh, my, oh, the world's <laughs> What happened to my perfection of reality? And, um, and, 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 but, and, but then you see that's perfect. Too. If there's that k kind openness that starts to come with the cons, then 
Oh, yeah, I clutched. Oh, I, don't, I do that, don't I? That's kind of cute, you know. <laughs> so, <laughs> I was feeling pretty free, and I decided <coughs> I'd put it in a bottle and I'd share it with my friends. And, <laughs> and, and so it became a new, you know, became a new object, you know. And, uh, and so then it was outside me, so I didn't have it, and, and so on. We started to get hip to those <coughs> dopey moves we had, and then we started not to disapprove of dopey moves. I mean, what's wrong with that? So I did it, yeah. And, and that's a beautiful time because things flow. Yeah. Before I started working with Collins, I could feel that in some way there's a, a great force in life and a great light in, li in life. You know, the trees and the animals and people. And, and I could see it, but most of the time I didn't live that way and I didn't have much capacity. I didn't know how to live that way. Most of the time I was like, you know, scheming and plotting and trying to, whatever it was, get ahead or achieve more or whatever, and, and all innocent things, but not related to joy. And, um, and so then, at some stage, you notice that, oh, you're spending more time with the world holding you up. You're spending more time permeable to the world. You're free. That even, and it's not about being happy all the time or having a positive attitude. It's probably in the way, actually, you know, because it's a bit forced, you know. Um, but uh, it's more about if you're sad, you're just sad, you're free. If you're happy, you're just happy, you're free, you know. And you don't disapprove of what you're feeling any more than you don't disapprove of the rain, you don't disapprove of the sun, you're not critiquing yourself all the time. You know? You're not saying, I must get this basketball in the hoop. <coughs> You know, you're just throwing a basketball, or you're just dancing. So that kind of lack of, you, you, we pass through the, passing through the gate is passing through being outside our own lives, and so we start to have our, our genuine lives. One, one, one of my friends long ago described this to me, he said, well, I've always felt like Pinocchio, but now I'm becoming a real little boy. <laughs> and I thought it was kind of nice, actually, because there is that way in which instead of doing the thing that's, you know, off the shelf with, with ourselves. And, uh, and there's, so some people have that as like, you know, it just sort of dawns and, you know, there are people, you read textbooks that say, oh, I had, there was this great experience, and, you know, and they found one person who can tell you this operatic experience and they put it in the book and everybody's supposed to have that experience. Um, but it's not, you know, it's not, you, you don't have an experience that somebody else had, mystical experience that somebody else had. You have your mystical experience, you know, which might be like something like, wow, I really like hearing the birds, or, you know. The creaking of the floor when people walk, isn't that great, you know. <laughs> so it could be something, you know, anything, that, no matter how humble is the entry to freedom. And all the notion about koans, it, it's really not so much to answer the question on the surface of the question, like, does the dog or me, or am I worthy or something, but to give us the experience of the realm in which the predicament is, is, is free, is, is a gateway. It's, the predicament is, in fact, the worst obstacle and predicament we have is actually on our side because it gives us this possibility, and the koan just represents that for us. The Tibetans have this thing about like driving all the crit criticism and blame into one thing, and Collins do gather all your predicament like that. And, and um, fortunately, we all have our predicament, don't we? The person without a predicament, please stand up. <laughs> but it's great. And then we start realizing, wow, you've got a you've got a predicament. You've got a predicament. You look wonderful. <laughs> and it's so great. You know, we think, oh. Then my, you're wonderful. You've got to predict. I, I can't be that bad. You know. <laughs> <laughs> so this starts the the playful, light-hearted quality that I think is part of Collins. <coughs> it become, comes to the appears. You know, and it appears. We might say it appears involuntarily, because meditation is not not this sort of thing I'm 
winding up all the time. It still has to happen, and that's why it's not about inside meditation, it's not about standing, it's not about sitting, it's not about in the hall or in the kitchen. It's about, um, you know, we're just free. You know? <coughs> and, and it's just here. And, and after all, it's pretty hard to find something that's not meditation. You know? find, find me a moment, and find me a moment that's not, doesn't have beauty. 